Dear Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here tonight as the Henry Clay class of 1990. Let our hearts be warm of fond memories, friends, teachers, and accomplishments from Henry Clay, and our minds be open to new ideas, goals, and possibilities for our future. Let every member of the class of 1990 have courage as they leave the secure halls of Henry Clay, for courage is a special kind of knowledge, the knowledge of knowing what and what not to fear. And from this knowledge comes an inner strength that can inspire us to push, push on in the face of great difficulties. What seems impossible is often possible with the power of courage. Amen. I will introduce our platform guest. Please hold your applause until all have been introduced. Mrs. Edith Hayes, Deputy Superintendent. Dr. Ron Walton, Superintendent of the Fayette County Schools. Dr. Lyman Ginger, member of the Board of Education. Mr. David Chittenden, member of the Board of Education. Mr. Barth Pemberton, Chairman of the Board of Education. Mr. Austin Sims, member of the Board of Education, Mr. Barney Tucker from the State Department of Education, and Mr. Neil Stigemeyer, Area Assistant Superintendent. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> the commencement address is to be given this afternoon by members of the graduating class. They are not speaking in the order as listed on the program, so I will give you the order in which they will speak. It will be Chad Gauntz, Tawana Benbo, Richard Rhodes, and John Hall. Platform guests, parents, friends, and the class of 1990. Looking back through all the years of our school's existence, we have conquered many challenges, from district and state championships all the way to our 1924 Boys National Basketball title. The school is rich in tradition, and as we have shown on March 20th, when we presented 66 trophies to the school, we fulfilled our end of the bargain for keeping a winning tradition alive. We do not just have basketball and football trophies. Our achievements range from academic and debate teams, even to our swim team state titles. This year, we had 19 national merit semifinalists, which is the most in the state. Our cheerleaders can match their reign with Ms. Donna Robinson against any in the state or even in the nation. But our school not only excels in academics and sports either. For the past three years, we have shown our generosity by donating more money to the United Way of the Bluegrass campaign than any other Fayette County school. Our school has its rich sports traditions due to our skilled coaches and athletes. But the reason for the great tradition in academics is due to our wonderful parents, teachers, and also our administrators. We would not be as successful today if it were not for you. So thank you very much. As you know, this year was an unusual year for us due to our having an interim principal. But knowing the easy adaptability of our faculty and staff, the school functioned more smoothly than it ever has. Our school has forever been known as the Rebel School of Lexington. If there were one thing I could change to better the school, it would be to convince the community of the positive accomplish accomplishments that we, have been, that we have achieved by our students. Where do these achievements take us in life? How do these achievements in school affect us out of school? Every day, students are being trained from the tardy policy to on-time homework. Everyone might say, well, I think the, po the policy was too hard. But if you were late to work five times, safe would be a pleasant comparison to losing your job. The skills taught to us, besides our reading, writing, and arithmetic, are just imp as important as anything else we do. Our achievements at Henry Clay will take us in many directions, from continued education to the military, or straight on into the workforce. Our faculty has wonderfully trained the students moving on into college through their wonderful teaching techniques. They've prepared us through homework, 
classwork, and also through those wonderful things called tests. By studying for our finals several hours a night during the finals week, we learned how to cram, or, or I mean study, for these tests. Our faculty has trained us for the workforce by helping us to face the solitary confinement, or what we call safe. Our parents have trained us for the military by giving us many orders daily, while our brothers and sisters have helped us learn for our toys or country. Looking back through this year, the most vivid memory I have to this day is of homecoming. Around 50 to 60 students showed up to either decorate for the dance or to decorate for the halftime festivities. The rain drizzled on and off throughout the entire day, and the wind blew just hard enough to ruin all of the slightly wet floats. By the time halftime rolled around, most of the floats were completely destroyed. The judges judged the floats as they thought they had looked before, and somehow the junior class won. This was one of the defeats we, the class of 90, had to endure throughout the year. This defeat was taken in stride, of course, but the worst defeats we suffered through the entire year were to Takes Creek and Jessamine County. We showed our class and accepted our defeat both in basketball and baseball, but nothing hurt worse than those two losses. So as you can see, our high school senior year was very well-rounded. We learned how to win with poise and lose with dignity. And this is one of the greatest achievements because anyone can win and brag, but it takes a good person to lose with class. Graduation is our final victory here at Henry Clay, and the good part about it is that no one loses, but all of us are winners. My task tonight is to present the class of 90 with a challenge, something we can use now and later in life. As our generation faces the issues of today, we can make a difference. So I ask you, can one person make a difference? Yes, if they have the three Ds, a dream, determination, and a destiny. With these attributes, one person can make a difference. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whom we are all familiar, had a dream. He dreamed that someday all men would be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. He was very determined to make this dream a reality. So determined that he suffered beatings, was placed in jail, and finally killed. The future was his destiny. Though we have not completely fulfilled Dr. King's dream, we are making progress every day. Dr. King made a difference. We all know of at least one teacher that has made a difference in our lives. Their difference was made through a dream to become a teacher. Their determination is to help us succeed in life by helping us gain knowledge that would be useful in later life. Their destiny is to see us through successful experiences until we reach our destiny. Without a doubt, our parents possess the three Ds. Our graduation from high school is the first step of their dream. It was their determination that got us to school day after day. Their destiny for us now is for us to further our education and to be a productive part of society. Great leaders, like Dr. King, great teachers, which we have all experienced, and great parents that have nurtured us through the stages of our life, all have left us a dream to fulfill. If we accept the responsibility to continue our education, that we might make a difference in the world today, our first step is to have a goal. Goal. The word goal frightens some young people and I've often wondered why. Is it because in order to achieve a goal, one might have to plan their future? Or is it the fact that setting goals is a sign of independence and maturity? I was so curious about the word goal that I looked it up in Webster. Webster defines goal as being the end towards which effort is directed. Oh, okay, I understand. No, I'm not going to lie. I don't understand. Goals are positive. They are set to give us direction in life. Believe it or not, we are about, 
We are about to complete our first goal, which is graduating from high school. Isn't this a great feeling? I find nothing frightening about receiving my high school diploma. A certificate that proves we have successfully completed 12 years of schooling and are now qualified and capable of progressing in today's society. We can all have this feeling again, but only we can make that decision. Each one of us possesses the three Ds within. The question is, will we allow them to surface? I would like to conclude my speech with a poem titled, You Are the One. You are the one who has to decide whether you'll do it or toss it aside. You are the one who makes up your mind whether you'll lead or linger behind. Whether you'll try for the goal that's afar or be contented and stay where you are. Take it or leave it, here's something to do. Just think it over, it's all up to you. What do you wish, to be known as a shirk or known as someone who's willing to work? Scorned for a loafer or praised by your chief, rich or poor, beggar or thief. Eager or earnest of dull through the day, honest or crooked, it's you who must say. You must decide in the face of the test whether you'll shirk it or give it your best. Class of 90, we will not shirk our responsibility. Thank you. My plans for the future are to go into sports medicine, bring home a six-digit paycheck, and marry a millionaire. This is one of the answers I got in a small survey I conducted in the Henry Clay Library one morning. I asked every senior there what he or she was planning for after graduation and what goals they had for the future. One girl said, party for the rest of the week, get a dumb job and go to college. Then she added, be successful, have lots of kids, be happy and get rich. Some other answers were, live it up as long as I can and have fun. Then settle down, get a job and make some money. And change the world and try to make a living at the same time. Still other seniors had plans to own their own business and become a millionaire and go to Taiwan, attend college at UK, then travel around the world with an international business. This is what a few high school seniors have said about their goals. But what if I could take a survey of famous and well-respected people throughout the world? What would they say about people's goals? Martin Luther King Jr. says, not all men are called to specialized or professional jobs. Even fewer rise to the heights of genius in the arts and sciences. Many are called to be laborers in factories, fields, and streets. But no work is insignificant. All labor that uplifts humanity has dignity and importance and should be undertaken with painstaking excellence. Mother Teresa says, what we do is a drop in the ocean, but if we didn't do it, the ocean would be one drop less. And Mahatma Gandhi says, consciously or unconsciously, every one of us does render some service or other if we cultivate the habit of doing this service deliberately, our desire for service will steadily grow stronger and will make not only for our own happiness, but for the happiness of the world at large. Dr. King stresses excellence. Mother Teresa stresses contribution. And Gandhi stresses service. Whereas we seem to be more concerned with what affects ourselves rather than how we affect other people. We are about to take control of our futures and our lives, but we can't get anywhere unless we have some goals to guide us. Only we can decide what those goals will be and, with a little determination, what our futures will be like. Almost every senior in the library that morning had some type of goal for him or herself, and we all have an idea of our plans. But as we leave this place and walk into the future, the voices of the past continue to remind us of our real purpose. 
excellence in all we do, our individual contribution to society, no matter how small, and most importantly, service to our fellow man and to the world. Finally, to quote Mark Twain, let us endeavor to so live that when we come to die, even the undertaker will be sorry. Change is the law of life. And those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. John F. Kennedy made this statement almost 30 years ago in West Berlin. I wonder sometimes if he somehow knew of the many changes in technology and society that would follow his death in Dallas in 1963. Just think, some of the simplest things that we take for granted could only have been dreamed of in the early 60s or even at the time of our births. Take, for example, a typical person. He wakes up every morning at 7 a.m. to the sound of a digital alarm clock. He then drives to work in his new Japanese import. When he returns home in the evening, perhaps he feels like relaxing while listening to a compact disc or watching his widescreen TV while eating his microwave popcorn. And if he does watch TV, he'll probably see a story on Soviet reform, the independent struggle of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, or maybe a story on the democratic elections in Eastern Europe and German reunification. Anyway, everything he has done in this example has been a result of changes that have occurred in the last 15 to 20 years. In fact, everything but the invention of the digital alarm clock or products of the 1980s. And all the news items are changes that have occurred in the last year. None of these changes could have been foretold by anyone in our parents' generation. No one would have believed that the Cold War could end, space missions would become a common occurrence, or that new forms of music, such as rap and reggae, would become popular. And the 1980s have only shown that the changes around us are coming faster and faster, leaving us with less time in which we can adapt to them. However, I do not think Kennedy would limit his statement to only technological or sociological change. I do believe, though, that Kennedy was making yet another appeal to everyone as individuals. Each of us must make an effort to remake the world in a better light, not as a copy of the past, nor as a distorted vision of the present. No. Instead, the future must be new. We were born in an era of change. And we know that we are influenced by it in every small bit of our lives. Therefore, only by changing ourselves first can we create a better future. I cannot tell you how to change yourselves or exactly what you should become, and it would be a crime if I tried to. Each of us is unique, and perhaps my concept of better doesn't fit your ideas. All I do know is that anything you choose to do, anything you set your mind to is good as long as you believe it is right. We are the inheritors of change. We need change to survive. I know this sounds ambiguous in general, but I also know that any change, any action, is better than none. However, we must remember to tamper this need with a purpose, the betterment of ourselves and ultimately humanity. I think someone summed it up best when he said, it is not the goodness of saints that makes us feel there is hope for humanity. It is the goodness of common men.